Guys, just, uh, let's get into this thing. I know our time is kind of running ahead of us, so I'm going to try and keep this as short as I can, and some of you are laughing at that. But, um, but uh, I have something significant, I think, and it's very simple. Uh, you do know we have an enemy out there. Um, many would look at him and say, Satan is our ultimate enemy, and I would tend to agree with that. But in the wake of Satan, he brings a whole bunch of stuff with him that is equally as, as impairing upon our Christian lives as he probably is just in himself. We've been talking about this uh, little series, a mini-series, building up to Easter. We've been titled it, It Is Finished, taking the words of Jesus as he hung on the cross that, that incredible day. And after the mission was accomplished, after everything was done, Jesus cried, it is finished. And we've been looking at a couple of things to say, what is finished? As a result of Jesus' work on the cross last week, we said, hopelessness is finished. It is done. It is dusted. There is no need for hopelessness in our lives. It would be really good for us to understand that and make that declaration and then go ahead and, and, and live it out. And I'm not taking away some of the pain of some people's lives, but hopelessness need not be a part of your life because Jesus says through the cross, it is finished. And then today I want to pick up on another big, big one, and that is that Jesus would suggest through his work on the cross that shame needs to go. Shame. Shame on you. You know, how often have we said that to people? We say it in our lives. We talk about people who've messed up. We say, shame on you that you would do that. We say it to our kids. We say it to our dogs. And I, and I want to talk about this, this thing of, of shame today. Now, there's a great theme that we can align this shameful sort of theme to, and that is the theme of giants. Whenever you see giants in Scripture, you will see that these are people who stood in the way of the will of God. We, we see how giants are kind of like mountains, that God says you want to define a mountain. A mountain in your life is anything that stands in the way of will of God for your life. Giants do the same thing. And there are some giants out there, but to start off today, very quickly, we need to have a different way of thinking on the subject of these giants. As we tend to think that the giant is there, I need to get bigger, I need to get stronger, and I need to be able to fight this giant on his terms. That's stupid. How many of us have tried to do that, and we fail every single time? We have these giants of bad habits, we have these giants of addictions, we have these giants in front of us, and we try to fight these giants, we fight them on his terms instead of on a biblical term. That's why I love the story of Caleb. I mentioned him often to you, how Caleb understood how to deal with giants. The guy is 80-something years old. Joshua is resettling the promised land, and he's looking for somebody to take the hill country. But nobody wants to own the hill country until Caleb, 85-year-old man, says, Joshua, give me the hill country. I know there are giants there. I know that the sons of Anak hang out there. But give me the hill country, and I'll sort those giants out. And God, in a moment of, of absolute excitement, declares this of Caleb. He says, this is a man who thinks differently. Thinks differently. Some of the interpretations will say he has a different spirit within him. You see, people, if you want to deal with the giants of hopelessness and shame and anything else that is standing in the way of the will of God for your life, you have to begin to think differently. Now, the tendency within us is to try and get bigger than the giants. And we'll fight them because we get stronger. We get, oh, I've tried that. That doesn't work. We've got to get cleverer rather than bigger. And that is what Caleb actually did. But the most well-known giant that we find in Scripture would have to be Goliath. You know what Goliath's Hebrew name was? It means shame. It means shame. Go and read the interpretation. You'll see Goliath mean, in the Hebrew word, it means shame. Is that not what he did for 40 days before he fought with David? He just laid shame on the Israelites. He said, you're useless. You're never going to amount to anything. You are a nobody. You are, you're absolutely hopeless. And it got the Israelites into that shameful position of cowering behind the rocks before they came in for the kill. They just, all he did was lay shame on them. He lived up to his name, which simply means, means shame. So what I'd like today is to take a Caleb mindset of thinking differently and apply it to the shame of Goliath in the context of how to deal with this big giant in our lives. Now, I was going to tell you this. I was going to tell you that shame in any shape or form is bad. I was going to tell you that, but I'm not so sure that's true. 
Because there is one who is allowed to and could probably be able to show, lay some shame on people because he's, he's perfect in himself. When you're perfect, then you can start laying shame on somebody else. But until you are perfect, don't you dare lay judgment or shame on anybody. Because only perfect people are allowed to do that. And I see Jesus as the only perfect person. And Jesus probably, and I'm putting it into my own words, would have looked at, at the temple that day. You know, Mark chapter 11, we see Jesus arriving at the temple. And he sees the con artists and the rip-off men. And they're ripping off the poor people and they're selling them prices, sacrifices at exorbitant prices. And something rises up within Jesus. And he goes amongst them and he turns over the tails. He makes a whip and he beats them. He says, shame on you, man. Shame on you for doing this to the poor and the underprivileged and the under resourced Shame on you would have been words that could legitimately have come out of the mouth of Jesus because of his perfection. What about in Matthew 20, where there's that blind beggar sitting at the gate? He's broken. Be there forever. People drag him to the gate every day, and he just cries out for arms. One day he hears that Jesus is in town, and the people get excited, and he gets excited, and he starts to shout out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He can't see anything. He just perceives in the atmosphere that Jesus must be around. And the crowd started shouting him, say, blind man, be quiet. Blind man, have nothing to do with you. Have you done Jesus? Is, yeah, he's so important. He hasn't got time to hang around with a blind man like you. Be quiet, they would have said to him. And then Jesus would have said, shame on you people. Shame on you people. Bring that blind man to me. And the blind man was found in the presence of Jesus and Jesus healed him. What about in Mark chapter 10, where, where the disciples are chasing the kids away from Jesus? And Jesus said, guys, what are you doing? They say, Jesus, you haven't got time for children. Jesus, you're a busy man. You've got big sermons to preach to adult people because they're the ones with all the, the prestige and the power and the popularity and the, and the prosperity. Jesus, you need to preach to those people. You haven't got time for kids. And Jesus could well have said, shame on you. Let those killed kids come to me, because for such is the kingdom of heaven. Shame on you. Shame on any church that doesn't have a, have a kid's vision. Shame on you, because these are the ones that Jesus loves, man. And shame on us if we stand in judgment of people who sin. Shame on us. But only Jesus is allowed to say that. I'm not saying it. Only Jesus is entitled to say that. What about the Mark, the Mark chapter one where the leper comes to Jesus and he said, Jesus, I'm a leper, I'm kind of hopeless. I'm going to die of this awful disease. But Jesus, if you will, you can make me better. <laughs> I saw you raise the dead. I saw you heal the blind. I was standing at a distance, Jesus, because I couldn't get into the crowd because I couldn't get close to you because the crowd was around. And if I come into the crowd, they're going to stone me, Jesus. And Jesus sees this man. He doesn't just heal him with his words. He reaches out and he embraces the untouchable. I wonder if other people saw what took place that day. Because here's what Jesus would have said. Those people said, Jesus, don't touch that leper. Jesus, get away from him. He's got leprosy. Jesus, don't get too close to him. He's, 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 he, you're going to die. Jesus, don't touch the man. And Jesus reaches out and he embraces the leper. And, they, and Jesus would have turned to them and said, what will you guys do? I said, Jesus, we, we know how to handle lepers. We stone them. And then we tie a rope around their foot and we drag them out of town and we dump their bodies far away from here so that we don't get contaminated. Jesus would have said, shame on you. Shame on you that you would treat the downtrodden and those who are rejected. And shame on you that you would do that. But only Jesus is allowed to say that because Jesus is perfect. John chapter 8, a great example. The woman caught in adultery. How tragic. Man, consequences, awful. Caught in adultery. And the people are saying, Jesus, don't you worry about her. We know how to handle her too. They begin to pile up the stones and to throw them at this woman caught in sin. Never mind the man. He was caught in sin as well. And they thought to throw the stones. And Jesus walks into the midst and begins to talk to this woman in her brokenness and in her just absolute terrible situation. And Jesus whispers words of hope to her, words of forgiveness Go and sin no more, he says to her. And then he would have turned to those people and says, anybody here perfect? If you want to be perfect, if you feel throw to those stones. If you want to throw to the law says you're right. The law says stone her. But if anybody is perfect, let him throw the first stone. And nobody threw the stone. 
And when she opened her eyes to look, there was nobody there except Jesus. And Jesus could well have said to those people, shame on you, that at this woman's time when she needs more love than anything else, you wouldn't throw stones at her. Shame on you for doing that. And so there's only one person who can legitimately speak the words of judgment of shame, and that you all know is Jesus. But there is the enemy. There is the Goliath factor. And as much as Jesus may have said these things to these people, Satan has the same ability to say the same thing to us, but it, it's a killer. It's a big giant in our lives. And the voice of shame will come to you and will speak into your mind. I've heard that voice before. I've heard the voice of shame saying, Trevor, listen, you said you were never going to do that again, and look what you've done. Trevor, you, know, you said you would never judge that person, and look what you've done. And I hear that voice of shame. But on the one hand, I hear the voice of Jesus' gentle conviction. And conviction is what we need to respond to. The voice of shame is a fine line between the voice of Jesus' conviction and the voice of shame that will drag you into a whirlpool that will make you ineffective for the kingdom of God. And that's not what Jesus wants. So the first thing we need is a discernment between Jesus' voice of conviction and Satan's voice of shame. They may sound very similar, but it's the source from which they come. That gives them the credibility. And when Jesus said it, then we need to respond to it. But the voice of shame will tell you a few things. Let me give you a couple of illustrations here. And this is not going to be some deep exegetical. So I just have one point for you today. I'll get to it in a minute. Here's what the voice of shame says. Shame says, you're a victim. <laughs> Shame would love to tell you, you're a victim. It was the voice of shame that spoke to Gideon and said to Gideon, you're never going to mount too much. And when the angel came and said, Gideon, go in the strength that you have and go and deliver Israel from the Midianites. And it was the voice of shame that would have spoken to Gideon and said, don't listen to the angel. Who are you? Who do you think you are? You should be ashamed of yourself that you think that you could deliver Israel. You're the weakest man of the weakest tribe of the weakest family of the weakest nation of Israel. Shame on you that you think you're just a victim, Gideon. What about it? Mark chapter 5, where we have the demon-possessed man who Jesus delivered from the demons. And he would have gone to the people after his deliverance, and the people said, hey, we know who you are. You're that demon-possessed man who lived up in the hill, and all he wanted to do was tell him the story. Yes, that was me, but now I've, I'm a new creation. Now, I'm, now I'm, I'm somebody else. Jesus has delivered me from the demons. And those people would have shouted at that man and said, Get back in your cave. You should be ashamed of yourself that you would even think to get out of your cave. Demon-possessed man, ex-demon-possessed man, whatever, get back in your cave. And they would have laid a lot of shame on, onto him. And they would have told him, Man, you are a sinner. What about in Luke chapter 15, we have the, the prodigal. And he went out, he did his thing, hey, messed up his life, trashed his dad's reputation. And uh, one day when he's at the bottom, he says, man, I, I need to get right. He goes back to his father and he makes the declaration, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. And I'm no more longer worthy to be called your son. Can I just be a slave to you? I'll just be a slave. If you'll just give me a roof over my head and a meal, I'll be happy, Dad. I'd rather call you boss than Dad. And he had the slave mentality that was accentuated by his brother. The brother who had spent all that time with the father. When the other brother, prodigal brother, came home, that brother would have laid a lot of shame on him. Darn, man, who do you think you are? You should be ashamed of yourself. You've trashed dad's reputation. You've lost all my inheritance. You've lost every man. And he would have laid more shame and more shame and shame because he was the brother. But the father, however, saw him somewhat differently. Satan would want for you to know that the voice of shame suggests that you are a slave. The voice of shame also suggests that when you mess up, you are finished. You are done. And this world is not made for people who mess up. This world is made for winners, people who do well. It's not made for people who, who do stupid things and mess up. You are finished. You're like Lazarus in the grave. And you are dead and you are dusted until Jesus comes along. 
And they would have said at, at the point of Lazarus, when Lazarus came out of the grave, the people would probably have said, Lazarus, what are you doing out the grave? You're finished, man. Get back in the grave, man. We saw you die. You've been dead for four days. Lazarus, you should be ashamed of yourself. Get back in the grave. Get back in the grave where you belong. You should be ashamed of yourself. You are finished. What about this one? The voice of shame would love to tell you that you're a beggar. That you're a beggar. <laughs> That's why I love the story of Mephibosheth. He has this man who could offer David nothing. And David brings him back into his family. And he puts him at the right hand in the table next to him. And he says to Mephibosheth, Mephibosheth, I'm going to restore to you everything that your father Saul had, your grandfather Saul, and I'm going to make you, you know, I'm going to make you like one of my favorite sons. You're going to sit at the point of authority. And here's this man, a crippled man, who could add no value to David's life whatsoever. And all the other brothers who come to the table, man, they would have said to Mephibosheth, they would have said, hey, Mephibosheth, what are you doing sitting next to Dad? We should be sitting. Solomon would have said, hey, man, I'm the next to charge here. Hey, get out of my seat. You're a beggar, man. Get out of my seat. And, and David would have said, no, he's not a beggar. But the world would have laid shame on him. The other brothers would have been said, shame on you. You shouldn't be sitting at our table anyway. You are but a beggar. Shame would want for you to know that he perceives you and tells you that you are a beggar. Luke chapter 9. What about the voice of shame will tell you that you are so small. Nothing you have is worthy to God. God can't use you. You're just too small. Well, just think about that in the context of those yeah, little kid that brought his lunch to Jesus. And the disciples would have laid shame on that little guy. When the little guy would have heard Jesus say, man, guys, go out and feed the people. And they say, Jesus, we've got nothing to feed them with. And the little guy puts up his hands and say, oh, yeah, we have. I've got a few loaves and a few fish. Jesus, can you use this? And the disciples would have laid shame on that little guy and said, who do you think you are? <laughs> What's a few loaves and a few fish amongst 5,000 people? Get out of here. And Jesus would have heard his disciples and he would have said, shame on you that you would do this and that you would chase this young man away because he gives something that is so small. What about delusional? These are the words that Jesus would have heard from Satan in the Garden of Gethsemane. He knows the cross is not far off. And he's in that, that incredibly emotional state. He knows he's about to die. He knows God's plan. And he's crying out, and then he hears probably the words of shame from Satan saying, Hey, Jesus, <laughs> is he, Jesus, Jesus, just hold on a minute. You, 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 do you really think, Jesus, that the death of one man can appease the sins of the world? Jesus, come on, get with the program. Jesus, surely you are delusional in thinking that, this. Jesus, you should be ashamed of yourself to think that one man can take away the sin of the world. Jesus, this is just not going to happen. And he would have laid shame. Jesus, you should be ashamed of yourself for thinking that. Surely that's illogical. And in his humanity, Jesus would have suffered that same burden, hearing the voice of shame. Is it right? Can I? In my humanity, I know who I am. But is it true, Father, that the sins of, of the world can be laid upon me should I shed my blood? Or am I just delusional as the voice of shame would say to me? Hey, people. Anybody here heard the voice of shame? <laughs> the voice of shame. It says, hey, I saw that. I remember back in those days, you know, when you, you said this and then you did, oh, my word, you should be so ashamed of yourself. People, listen carefully. That is the voice from the pit of hell. But I wonder how many of us today have heard that particular voice. Now, we're going to ask ourselves, how do we deal with this voice of shame? So I want to read to you the well-known story of David and Goliath. Goliath, remember, you could substitute his name for shame over here. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I do want to pick up on one thing. And out of this entire passage, I just want to find one truth that will revolutionize your dealing with the giant of shame. I'm going to pick it up. It'll come up on the screen as well if you haven't got your Bible and read along with me. It's 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to read from verse 40. Now, J. David had come along. And had heard Goliath laying shame upon the Israelites across the valley, naming himself as the champion, threatening them, challenging them to come and fight with him. He went down to Saul. He said to Saul, Saul, I'll, I'll take on the man. Saul said, what entitles you? He says, I fought a lion and a bear, and I think I can deal with this giant. And so they would have tried Saul's armor on him. 
and it didn't fit at all. And David said, I can't fight with these things. And so we read how David went down to the brook and he picked up five stones. He only needed one of them, which is the one thing I want to look at just now. And he needed one. You don't need five. You just need one stone to bring down the giant. Just one. I want to show you what that one is as we read this passage. Let's go from, from there. <clears throat> He's just trying the armor on. He says, I can't go in these things, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. Here's verse 40. Then he took his staff in his hand, chose five stones, smooth stones from the stream, put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, he approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was only a boy, ruddy and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistines cursed David by his God. Come here, he said, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come against me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I will strike you down, and I will cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth, and the whole world will know that there is a God in heaven. Yo, oh, love this. As the Philistine moved closer to attack, verse 48, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and he struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistines with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and he killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with a sword. Oh man, this is... This is PG-16, 18 maybe. This is on TV. And we tell these stories to our kids, you know, about David cutting off heads. And Man, it's a great story. It's got everything in it. But the key for us is understanding that conversation. As David would have come towards Goliath, Goliath would have said, Who the heck are you? Who do you think you are? Voice of shame. Saying, do you think that you can really fight against me? Have you not seen how big I am? I'm 10 foot tall, David. I've got a shield and I've got a, a sword and I've got a, a spear with a, with a head that weighs over 6 kgs. And, and you can't even get your little hand halfway around the beam of this. It's as thick as a weaver's beam. David, who do you think you are? And it's the answer to that question that gives us the answer when shame comes to us. Who do you think you are that you would dare stay up, stand up against the giant of shame? And here's the key. So simple. David says, I know who you are. I know who God is. And because I know who God is, I know who I am. You've got to know who you are before you stand up to face the giant of shame. Do you know who you are, people? If you're a believer today, and I'd love to assume everybody in here is, but maybe, I'm, maybe it's a little naive of me to think that. Maybe you're not a believer. Maybe you're just an inquirer. I'm so glad you are here. This could be a really good day for you. But when you know who you are by knowing whose you are, you'll be able to battle this giant, and you will have to, he'll have to fight you on your terms, not on his. Because he wants to fight you on his terms. You try that every time you fail. He's too big for you. Get the giant to fight on your terms, and you may well win the battle. You will know who you are when you know whose you are. David knew. He said, I come to you in the name. That's what he had. He said, don't you have anything better than a name? And David said, I just need a name. That's all I need. And the name would have insinuated everything, the greatness of who Jehovah was, the wonder of this great creative God who created the world. And this is thousands of years ago that this happened, but David knew enough about God to know that his God was great, his God was good, his God was everything. Go and read the Psalms and you get a picture of David's perceptivity of understanding who God, he didn't even have a Bible to tell him this stuff. But David knew who God was and therefore he knew who he was because he knew whose he was. And on the one hand, he's saying, I come to you in the name, the name of Jehovah. And I come to you in that name. Don't mess with Jehovah. He would have said to Jehovah, you met, don't mess with Jehovah. When you mess with me, you mess with him. Don't you dare mess with him, because you mess with me. Then I just thought about it. 
I come to you in a name. This is a beautiful picture of, of an association um, that David was said, I bear his name. He's not just an austere, distant God, but I bear his name. I am not him, but man, I bear the name of Jehovah. There's something different about that. You see, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, here's our key verse for us. It says this, your father is going to tell you, in Christ, you know what you are? You're a new creation. Now, that could be good news for you. You are a new creation. It says this, that all the past has gone away. And behold, everything has become new to you. If you're going to let go of the past, if you're going to let go of the failure, because you're a new creation, all you've got to do is behave like a new creation. Stop behaving like an old creation and telling everybody you're a new one. If you're a new creation, for goodness sake, believe that you are, and then live out that which you say that you believe, and you will deal with the giant of shame. You say, is it that simple? People, I'm telling you, I think it is. I absolutely think it's that simple. If we could recognize who we are because we know whose we are, things would change completely. I was thinking of trying to think of an illustration. It's not a perfect illustration, but it's the best I've got. Those of you who may like to go diving, I love going in the water. I'm not very good in the water. I, very often I nearly drown in the water, but I, I try. And I get in the water, and I'm just intrigued at the difference that there is between the waterline and us and the waterline and below. Just below that waterline is a completely different world. It's crazy. And then you put your head up and you say, wow, the other world is still here. You put your head on the waterline, you think this is a completely different world. And your ma imagination gets captivated. You restore your sense of wonder that, wow, there's another world down here. Look at the beauty of the coral and the, and the, the great white shark that's about to devour me. Look at it. It's just so cool. It's just amazing. It's another world under there. And it's like that when you become a believer. All of a sudden, you live in, in a new world, and you see, you're living in the same world, but you're seeing it differently. You're seeing the old world as if you were under the water seeing something completely different. Man, it's a, actually, it's not a bad illustration. I think it's a good one because it's a vision that you see under the water. It's just so different, different values, different principles, different ways of life, different things to survive. It's just so different, but it is beautiful. And everything looks different under the waterline. If we could live above the waterline like we perceive under the waterline, what a difference that would be. That's why I'm so believing in baptism. And I believe that the baptism is the submersion of going underwater. It's just a picture, but life is different under the water. And as you come out of the water, you take the underwater principles and you now live them above the waterline. We got a baptismal service on Sunday down at the beach. If you want to be baptized, I would encourage you, if you haven't been baptized as a believer, that you go and see Peter, Pastor Peter, and he would love to share with you the deeper truths of what I'm saying in 30 seconds. And baptism is just a picture of the old life dying and the new life coming out because something happens under the water. Life is different and will never be the same when you see it like, like that. Let's return to the board. If shame says that these are the things you are, then might be Irene would like this, but God. Irene Rada has a statement, but God. She loves that thing. But God says of you, you're not a victim, you're a victor. If you can see yourself as a new creation, you can learn from your mistakes. Gideon, you're not a victim. Go out there and deliver Midian. What is it that transitioned Gideon from this pathetic person? I'm the weakest to the strongest. Go out there and single-handed with 30-odd men, he wipes out the army of Midian, probably 200,000 people, without even a sword. What happened? He began to change himself in his thinking from a victim mentality to a victor's mentality. God, the voice of Shane will want to tell you that you're a sinner. The voice of God says, you're not a sinner. You're a saint. Your sin is forgiven. And you are now one of my children. You are, you're, you're with me in this thing. You're not a sinner. Don't listen to the voice of shame. Oh, you still sin. And the consequences of that sin will still be lived out down here on earth. I'm not taking that away. But in the eyes of God, when your sin is forgiven and you've repented, you're no longer a sinner. You were once. You still are in action. But in type and in God's eyes, man, <laughs> he sees you as a saint. The voice of shame will tell you you're a slave as per the as per the story of the prodigal son. The, the father says to the prodigal, you're not a slave. Man, you're a son. Just behave like one. Just behave like a son. 
Stop whining. Stop playing the victim. You'll never be a slave in my household. I don't care how much you've done and how you've trashed my reputation, lost all my money. You are not a slave. You cannot be a slave because you are my son. It is finished. The shame would tell you that you've messed up so badly you are finished. You're not finished. Oh, man, Lazarus came out there with a fresh view of life. Oh, he had to die again. You know, that's another thing he had to do. He had to die twice. But at least he came out. He got a fresh start to life. When Satan says to you, you're finished, you're done, you're dusted, you're never going to come out of the dust again. Don't people listen to him. Because God says, you're not finished. You've got a fresh start. As per Mephibosheth, they would have said, Mephibosheth, you're just a beggar. You know what a beggar says, David? You're a brother. And don't you listen to those people who would suggest that you're less than them. You are a brother. They would say you're small. The voice of God would say you're not small, but you are significant. Your small contribution as that little boy made a significant difference in the lives of a whole bunch of people. They left that day not only spiritually filled, but stomach filled because of the small and yet significant in God's hands thing that he did with the little boy. And then delusion, delusional, sorry. You're not delusional, Jesus. God would have said, the voice of shame would have said to Jesus, you're delusional. But the voice of God would have said, Jesus, you are divine, man. You are divine. You are the Alpha and the Omega. You are the beginning and the end. You are the light of the world. <sighs> you're, the, you're the resurrection and the life. You're the living water. You're the bread of life, Jesus. You are the Messiah, Jesus. And if you could get the understanding of what the difference between the voice of shame and what God says, you're a new creation, people. For goodness sake, go out there and behave like it. Go out there and behave like you're a new creation, putting your past behind you and saying, it is finished. It is finished. Yes. Let's go and live like that, people. Come, we better pray. Lord, today we are so aware that you're so good. We're so aware, Lord, of our frailty, of our weakness. But thank you that you do not stand in judgment of us. And of all people, you are the most entitled to do that because you are perfect. We are not. And therefore, we're not allowed to throw stones. Only you're allowed to do that. But Lord, today we want to thank you that we can deal with shame simply by finding the right stone. David did not need, need five stones. He just needed one. And he chose the stone of his identity in you to bring down the giant of shame. He didn't need the other four stones. The one stone that he needed was just to say to Goliath, I know who I am because I know whose I am. I come to you in the name of Jehovah, the God of heaven and earth. I am associated with him. I bear his name. I am a new creation. And don't you dare, Goliath, voice of shame, dare to speak otherwise into my life. I will bring you down with the little stone. I'm not going to try and get bigger and stronger than you. I've tried that and failed. I will bring you down with just a little stone. And it's the stone of my identity of being in Christ. To get into Christ, we know you tell us, Lord, how to do that. We come by repentance. We, we ask you to forgive us. And we renew our relationship. We, we get restored to you. And now we're in Christ. And when that happens, whether it happens as a single event or over a course of time, I don't know and I don't really care. Because, Lord, it just says we are new creations in who you are. Lord, I pray today that we would leave from this place determined to live that new creation lifestyle having by the stone that we have found washed off the shame, and then we're able to, by the cross of Jesus Christ, begin to live a different life. Lord, help us. To this end we pray in your name. Amen. Guys, Phil and I got creative on you. I almost want to apologize for what we're going to do right now. But I want to end this with a, hopefully, a, a very significant moment. We spoke just now about finding the right stone. David only needed one stone. He had five, but he only needed one because the, the need was to find a stone that was his identity with Christ. But before he could put his identity together, he had to do something like we all have to. 
David would have had to take this dirty, dusty stone, look at it, dirty and dusty, and he would have had to wash it off by the blood of Jesus, and he would have to wash that thing away, and so that there would have been no more shame on it. The shame gets washed away as a result of the death of Jesus. And then what he would have done is he would have consolidated that thinking, and maybe in the context of what we're doing, he would have dried his stone, his identity, and then he would have come across here and he said, Goliath, what's this? What's this? This is my name. My name is Trevor Hugh. Don't tell anybody that. Downham. Okay, this is my stone of identity in you, and it's the stone that is going to bring you shame down. So here's the deal. While the worship team lead us, we're going to invite you just to come to the front, get a stone, and do what I've just done. Get your stone. Go and wash off all the shame and the guilt that Satan has laid upon you. Dry your stone, grab a pen, write your name on it, and stick this on your mantelpiece. So every time you walk past it, you are reminded of who you are because you know whose you are. Have you got it, people? Do you know what to do? You don't look that bright. Okay. <laughs> Guys, this is a deep moment. This is a deep moment for you to deal with the shame. And anything that Satan has laid on you, and we all mess up, do we not? No one of us has a mess. But we can deal with that shame, wash it off, and use that stone as your identity in Christ that will bring this down.